welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. This is episode 34. I'm David Allen, host of the webinar series, uh, welcoming you uh, and, and thank you for joining us tonight, uh, along with my co-host Dale Fisher and Louise Sun. Uh, not much has happened this month, but we're going to try to make something exciting this evening. Uh, hi, Dale. Hi, Louisa. Um, what will you be sharing with us tonight, Louisa? I have quite a big segment tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking on treatment, and I'm trying to go through everything that we know on COVID-19 treatment so far. Uh, and you're going to do that in like 10 minutes? Yeah, about eight yeah, okay. All right. Sounds eight. good. Well, that it'll be concise. And, and Dale, you've located an old colleague. Um, what what would she what what would should we expect from your conversation? I got a little tongue tied there. No, it's great. I'm glad Louisa won't take long. I'll take up the extra time. I figured. Uh, yeah, no, we've got a got a lot happening in Epi this this uh, month. A lot's been happening around the world. Uh, caught up with a with a colleague who's uh, heading up the the COVID side of things at the Olympics. And, uh, and at the end, there's a, a must-watch video I've got to share, too. All right. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Uh, we'll open tonight's episode with the Focused Epidemiology segment, uh, for which uh, we'll, they will also include a conversation with Brian uh, McCloskey, um, and then uh, Luis's overview of COVID-19 treatments, and then me uh, providing the vaccine lightning round and closing the episode with Pandemic Song of the Month and uh, Dale's uh, video that he alluded to. Uh, while we may not mention uh, you by name, uh, we will answer questions you've submitted as best we can throughout our presentation. We do thank you for submitting the questions. Uh, again, we may not mention your name, but uh, it, they do influence what topics we cover. And, and again, we appreciate the, the help. Just a reminder, please do submit your questions and, to uh, and topics for next month's episode via the link in the chat box. Alternatively, you can just send it through uh, in reply to the email. So without further ado, Dale, over to you. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm going to just try and be a, a, a little bit uh, quicker, cover a little bit less to give us a bit more time to, to talk with, uh, with Brian about the Olympics. So uh, globally, uh, there's, there's sort of a, an, an interesting trend that you can, you can see is happening here is for, for one of the first times we've seen down here that, uh, that there's, there's increasing cases again, but actually the deaths look like they're starting to decline. So that's, uh, so, so that's the sort of uh, interesting epidemiologic component, which I can highlight in a minute. The other is, uh, is our, our southern neighbours, Indonesia, uh, well, southern and, and western, I guess, uh, are, uh, are obviously doing it very tough. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Indonesia later. Um, so here's the, uh, the, the six epi curves from the WHO regions, and you can see uh, that that interesting mix here is is where Europe you've got this surge in cases really over the last uh, few weeks they've uh, they've doubled in their number of uh, cases per day but uh, or in this uh, in this case uh, but but their their deaths are staying um, flat and that that's really what you'd expect uh, with a heavily vaccinated community uh, more on that in a minute we may also be seeing that in in, in the Middle East. But uh, you can see Africa, they're, they're doing the, the usual thing, Southeast Asia likewise, and, and, the, and the Western Pacific. So, so with that uh, interesting little nuance, let, let's go to the UK. Uh, firstly, uh, I'll just, uh, the outliers in this are really Russia and, and, and Georgia. Um, you can see uh, they're, they're really quite, quite flat, uh, but, but the deaths are, are quite high, 37 uh, deaths per million uh, over a, over a seven day period, uh, and Georgia likewise. But all the rest of the deaths you can see uh, essentially a, a, a single digit, despite these soaring cases. So, so you look, you know, UK up forty two percent in the last seven days. Uh, Spain's up, Netherlands, France. All these countries are seeing a lot more cases, which which means you have to hold your nerve if you're a decision maker, because this is what you see when you get vaccinated. Uh, but the hospitalizations and deaths aren't aren't there. Um, you could argue whether their vaccination rate is high enough yet, but but that's the point. Um, so France, for instance, has got about uh, uh, sixty percent one jab, fifty percent two jabs. Uh, I don't think anyone really believes that that's enough to, to really hold things back. And I'll talk about the Singapore situation uh, later. But, but since the, they've been having this uh, plateau, if you like, in, in, in vaccination uptake, uh, 
they've started with these vaccine passports or at least discussing them and and the communities uh, obviously marching the streets calling it a, a disguise mandate and you know you can't go into various uh, settings without without having proof of vaccination so 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 again we've got marching down the street we've got an inadequate um, vaccination rate and winter is coming so so I think Europe's uh, got some things happening uh, at, at least upcoming and again you can oops Again, and you can see in the other European countries, all these numbers in red, so high case numbers, but all the deaths are sort of single digit or, or even less than one per million in the last seven days. So, so that, that same mix based on, on the vaccination rate. We go to, to Southeast Asia, um, we see Indonesia's having this, this absolute surge of cases here. Um, it doesn't look like it on the main epi curve, but actually that's because India's come down. And India numerically is obviously just huge, but you've got Indonesia, Bangladesh, Thailand, Myanmar, all seeing surges of cases. Uh, and in, in less vaccinated, you can see that, the, the in, in, at least in some of these countries, Indonesia is 29 per million population deaths, um, Myanmar 28. And, and, and don't forget, this is, is surely in a, in a region of the world with, with under ascertainment of both cases and deaths so um and 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 just a word on indonesia uh it, it's really anything bad in a in an outbreak you, you can imagine and it's happening there and we've seen it around the world over the last year um so in the last five or six weeks you can look at what their their case num their recorded case numbers have done so so now over over a, um uh, over fifty thousand cases a day and and uh constantly over a thousand deaths a day. Uh, their their um, test positivity rate is is up to 30%, I think, of the of the provinces. Uh, Arche is the, the lowest at 19%. So um, so so again, under ascertainment. Uh, this is a tent uh, outside of a hospital in, in Jogjakarta. But but we know all over that there's bed shortages everywhere. There's oxygen shortages. Uh, drug shortages, shortages of funeral services, all those things we've seen in, in South America and, and indeed uh, Europe, India and other countries. Um, terrible stories of healthcare worker deaths. Uh, at least 20 have been, have been reported in, in vaccinated people um, uh, with, with some questions being put towards Sinovac. Um, the country is six percent vaccinated and uh, with two jabs, so so clearly um, a long way away and and got a long uh, a long battle ahead of it. The African region, again, just to to briefly say that this is a, another place surging with 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 uh, almost certain significant under ascertainment, uh, and again, it's it, it's uh, this this more classic chart with lots of reds, and as cases go up. Um, then you also see the death rates go up, and 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 most of these are in are in double figures, and these are in triple and four figures. So, so again, Africa, uh, low vaccination rates, and uh, and a tough uh, a tough six or twelve months ahead of it still. Um, okay, let's go to the Western Pacific region again, just quite quite quickly. Um, we can see that. Uh, Again, there's lots of red, so there's, there's plenty of surging, uh, particularly uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, I guess Philippines, Japan are, are, are sort of more consistent with the way they've been. South Korea, which is, has, has crept up since it sort of did a jump about four or six months ago. Mongolia, Fiji, look at, look at these numbers for a, for a, a country of uh, about 890,000. So, so these are... Uh, a huge numbers per million population, um, and again, so so with that uh, and the deaths, uh, the deaths actually not not too bad. Um, so that there must be some way of of shielding, uh, I guess, or mitigating those problems. Uh, Yo Pang Nam from from Malaysia asked, "What are the possible factors causing all these these surges?" And I would just make the point that uh, I think you can look at it as as four factors that can prevent. Um, uh, transmission, it's a vaccine, the public health measures, the, the quarantining, the, the contact tracing and everything. Then there's the borders and then there's the, the social restrictions. 
So if you go down these charts, look at a place like Vietnam, it, it obviously relied very heavily on the border restrictions. Uh, a couple of times it was able to snuff out clusters, but, uh, but, but it's never been able to regain that control. Malaysia, likewise, doing very well, but border controls were such an important part of, of, their, of their strategy, as with Mongolia, Fiji, indeed Australia, uh, Cambodia, so, so this is why the surges are, are happening. The, 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 the borders have been breached. Um, the public health systems are, are doing their best. Their vaccine rates are low. So that only leaves the social restrictions. And that's really why they're going from lockdown to lockdown to social restriction. And it's, and, and it's really, really hard. The answer is always going to be in the vaccine. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, they, they missed most of a year um, anyway with the pandemic, with their border restrictions. Uh, unfortunately, now it's being hit with, uh, with the Delta variant. So, of course, Singapore, in terms of those four restrictions, they're saying we want to max out the public health systems. We want to do well with our vaccine and we want to get rid of the social restrictions and the border controls. So these are the, this is the, the sort of strategy in terms of looking at those uh, those four things. So I hope that answers that question, which uh, which has come a few times. So now let's talk about about Singapore. Here's the the latest epi curve, and and you can see uh, bad timing because we're we we should be sort of coming towards the end of the of the sort of uh, problems of the pandemic in Singapore. Um, now, just to remind you, uh, these green ones are community linked and already in quarantine. The blue ones are community linked, but they're detected through surveillance. So that means they've got symptoms and gone along uh, or they've, they've been tested as part of mass screening or something like that. But, uh, but anyway, the, uh, and the yellows are unlinked. So you can see there's, there's around 100 for the last three days people that have been diagnosed not in quarantine. So this, this tells us we, we, we're not getting there yet. Um, we know there's about 28 active clusters um, at, at the moment, uh, and, and the, the large ones being the, the KTV lounges and the, the Jurong fishery. Actually, all these clusters are, are probably linked anyway. It's, uh, it's just that they become unlinked epidemiologically because you can't find the... The, the missing links, the people that sort of spread it to that other place necessarily. So, so therefore it looks different, but, but my understanding is a lot of these are, are genetically uh, uh, from the same, the same uh, place. Uh, so in the last 14 days, this is how we might gauge the problems the hospital's about to have. So you look at the, 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 the gray bars, which are fully vaccinated and we look at the, the blue, which are partially vaccinated, and the pink, which are completely unvaccinated. So it's good to see that because of the settings, I guess, the lounges and the, and the Jurong fishery, that most of the, the age groups are sort of in this uh, 20 to 60 mostly. Um, so so the, the number of the, the elderly, I guess, are um, uh, the, mostly vaccinated. So, so this tells us these vaccinated people are very unlikely to get sick, uh, these people are the ones with a higher risk uh, and would be a cause for our ICUs to be on standby sort of thing. Uh, these are the cases that have required um, ICU or, or oxygen. Uh, and, and as of uh, yesterday, um, there's, uh, there's eight in the whole country. So for all this, uh, this trouble, because of the high vaccination rates in the country, it's not really translating into people that need oxygen or intensive care or are dying. So, so it's just such a, a message to, to get vaccinated. And if you didn't have the message already, again, you can see fully vaccinated. I think in the last three months, there's only been about three people that have needed oxygen. Um, no one in ICU, no one died. Partially vaccinated, uh, a smaller number completely unvaccinated, the numbers are getting a little bit bigger. Of course, most people, most people are still young and, and most people don't get serious disease from COVID. But, uh, but if you're unvaccinated and you're elderly, then, then you're, you're, you're more at risk. And from the hospital perspective, um, you see that here because you know, the pinks are completely unvaccinated and the blue are the partially vaccinated. And, and it's just apart from one person up here who needed some oxygen, all the rest of the people that need care um, uh, are in the unvaccinated or partially vaccinated groups. So, so that's, um, 
that's where we sit from a hospital perspective. Uh, looking at Singapore's vaccination rate, uh, there was a question from Anastasia Sorkin in, in Singapore who asked why, the, why we're getting so many cases despite the high vaccination rate. And I think this tells you that the, the total population two jab vaccination rate is, is 50%. So that's not enough. So we're still going to see cases in, uh, uh, in people, uh, particularly unvaccinated people. But we'll see more and more people, more and more mild cases in vaccinated people. So we still do see those cases. We know it doesn't eradicate the disease. Um, it, it makes it milder. So that's the, uh, uh, the current state. You can see where these bars started to plateau, and that was really where, where the, um, you know, the, the, the age groups that were prioritised. So actually the 70-year-olds have been plateaued for quite a while, um, and, and that's why this is the problem. Of course, these groups that started much later are, are playing catch-up and, and very successfully, um, and, uh, and if I go to, um, to, to the next slide, we can look into the future because these are the one jabs. So these will all be two jabs in about three weeks and that, that's national day. So, so this is what the vaccination rates will be like around national day. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the lowest uh, vaccination rate will be in the, in, in the over 70s. So, so this is what's the stumbling block. This is our Achilles heel in Singapore at the moment. We got, uh, we got uh, questions from Vanya in Belgium and Declan McFadden, who's uh, half Singapore, half Irish, I think. Hi, Declan. Um, they're asking about uh, quarantine-free travel and when we can do it. A and, and this is the sort of time we can start talking about it. If government really wants to keep things tight because of these over 70-year-olds, they can do it. But I think the conversation will certainly be coming uh, real uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but it'll be in steps. We're not going to have a, uh, an open day like in, uh, in, in UK. What's it called? Freedom Day. I, I, I don't think that's uh, the style in Singapore. I think it's much more likely to be step by step and, and just watch and make sure it's not uh, causing an impact on, uh, on hospital care and things. Um, so just, just finally, again, you can, uh, we have no precedents. No one is showing us the way here. As you, if you look at all the one jab countries, uh, the, the, the countries that have had one jab, Singapore is ranked here. The only ones that have got more one jabs uh, are, all, are all small countries. There's no country over a million that's got more one jabs than Singapore. And that's important because that's, they're all going to be two jabs in, in three or four weeks. So, so if you look at these um, you know, you can say UK, aren't they better than us? Well, they are in two jabs now, but they're in terms of one jab, they're going to fall behind us uh, when it comes to the two jabs. And Israel's the same. They've got more two jabs than us, but their one jabs are only 63. So that's where they're going to be in a couple of weeks. So um, I might uh, leave it there. These are the QOs. There's, there's lots of uh, impact on people still. Um, and that's where we are now. You can see the numbers uh, being admitted to hospital in Singapore coming up. Now, um, so I, I just want to take uh, a moment now to, I was watching TV the other day uh, on Tuesday and I saw uh, an, uh, an old friend and colleague of mine, uh, Brian McCluskey, um, come on TV and I called him and I said, what are you doing in Japan? And he says, I'm chair of an independent panel advising the IOC. So he was happy to, to, to talk to me. Uh, uh, we'll show you an interview, but uh, uh, his background is as uh, Director of Global Health in, at Public Health England. Uh, he established the, the UK First, the, the Public Health uh, Rapid Response Team there. Uh, he's had senior positions in the, the Ebola response in West Africa. Uh, he was first discovered by the Olympic Committee when he worked in the uh, in London in, in 2012 at their games. So he was recruited to the 2016 team for Rio and the 2020 team for Tokyo. So anyway, I met uh, Brian and I asked him what his role was over in Japan. Hi, Dale. Good, good to see you again as well after, after this time. Uh, I'm here because I'm officially the public health advisor to the International Olympic Commission. And that's a role that's been grown in part since I ran the public health services for London 2012. So... Um, this must mean you've got good oversight of all the all the measures. I'm I'm thinking there must be 
bubbles everywhere, bubbles for countries, bubbles for sports and bubbles for contacts. So can you just give us a, a, a bit of a bit of detail in how the, the operations are working? Yeah, I mean, essentially we've been working on this since the decision to postpone the Games was made um, last, last March. And we've tried to approach it sort of going back to basic principles of how you manage an outbreak and how you manage uh, public health incidents. So we start by looking at all the basic public health and social measures that we all know and love around the world with masks and social distancing, et cetera. And then layer up on top of that, the other things that we can do to reduce the risk. And we spent about 12 months trying to work out what are the things that are most likely to make a difference and reduce the risk. And we think we've got to a point now where that we will have a very significant reduction in the risk and we can have the, the safe and secure, secure games that everybody talks about. But how, how do you do the separation that's uh, we're used to seeing thousands of, of people and mingling and uh, how are you going to separate the athletes from each other, for instance, or from the, from the, the support staff? Um, is, is there a big effort into to separating? Uh, there is, but we, we don't tend to call it a bubble because it's difficult to say that an entire Olympic village of you know, 11 to 14,000 people is a bubble. But what we've done is a thing called a playbook which is a, a description for the athletes and participants about what they have to do while they're in the games. Uh, and that builds up the picture of how they have to behave to protect themselves, what they can do to protect other people, and what they expect us to do to protect them. So that includes all the things about social distancing. So, for example, we've reduced the number of people who are in the village very substantially. That means that in the apartments, there's more uh, single apartments, single bedrooms. Uh, we've we just increase the capacity in the dining room, but have fewer people. So there's more space. Tables are spaced out. They've got plexiglass screens between people. There's more grab and go and takeaway options so people can order food and take it away so they don't have to sit in crowded places. Um, so we try to do what we can to make it easier to stay apart from people. And then there's also the rules that are enforceable because these are athletes who signed up to a code of conduct. And essentially that says if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they can be penalised, and that penalty could be anything from a reprimand to a fine to being sent home. Wow. So um, I'm, I imagine you're doing a, a lot of routine testing. Um, how often are you using rapid tests or PCR, saliva, things like that? Well, I'd say what we've done is two layers, really. We, first, the first thing we have available is that we have a PCR testing system in the village for anybody who becomes symptomatic. So anybody who gets unwell, can get a PCR test and result in three hours, uh, and then they're managed through the Japanese public health system. But on top of that, we have a regular screening program, and every participant in the village has been screened twice in their home country before they leave for the airport. They're screened when they land at the airport in Tokyo. They're screened when they arrive in the Olympic village, and then they're screened every day thereafter. And we're using the same quantitative antigen test that Tokyo has been using in the airport for the last year or so, as the initial test. If that's positive, it's a salivary uh, antigen test. If it turns out positive, they do a PCR test on the same saliva sample. And if that's positive, they're brought in for a nasopharyngeal PCR. So fairly substantial progress, because what, what we're trying to do, you know, obviously is balance the risk that a false negative will leave somebody in the village who's potentially infectious against a false positive, which means that an athlete who's been training for eight years isn't allowed to compete uh, when in fact there's nothing wrong with them. Just trying to tread that balance. Yeah. So, uh, are people doing their own tests, or have you got massive swab stations? Uh, I mean, people can do their own tests if they choose to. I mean, some teams bring them in. The Americans always bring an entire hospital with them virtually. But that doesn't matter. From our point of view, the only thing that counts is the test done in our screening system and our sampling station. So, there's a whole row of sort of sample collection points. So, people can do the saliva sample in their own room, but they have to be supervised by a peer. So, it's a peer review system. And then they drop the sample off at a station in the village and get the result back uh, in 12 hours. So obviously great turnaround times and, and plenty of different, uh, adapting plenty of different ways to get them, uh, to get the test. So um, what happens if there's a positive case? Um, I guess they're sent out of the village to an isolation facility or something? Uh, well, see, the, there's a slight gap, the 12-hour gap between, if you like, the first salivary antigen potentially being positive and the nasopharyngeal PCR is considered as a definitive diagnostic test. Okay. Um, once the nasopharyngeal PCR is positive, then they go for isolation uh, and they stay there for the 10 days. There's an option of having 
uh, PCR tests on day six, day seven. If they're both negative, they're released back into the competition. Um, but in the gap between, if you like, the initial possible confirmation and the final confirmation, we start work on the contact tracing so that the contacts are already been identified, ready to be managed if the test turns out to be finally positive. And what happens to, let's say you've got a, a genuine contact, what happens to that person? Is he quarantined? Is he, uh, is he allowed to compete? Well, we, we've got a special protocol agreed with the Japanese government for how we manage them, an adapted quarantine program, which means that they are allowed to continue training and competing under special circumstances. And that includes, for example, they can only stay in a single room on their own in the village. They have to eat all their meals on their own in the room in the village. They can only travel to, the, to and from the venue on their own in a dedicated car. And while they're at the venue training, they have to stay separate from other teams and only interact with people on their own team for, with whom essentially they're already buddied, if you like, in the training program. And they still get tested every day. Right. And then the final thing is that when it gets the day of competition, they have to have a negative nasopharyngeal PCR test within about six hours of the competition. And that's across all sports. I should imagine uh, wrestling and things like that might be uh, a bit more uh, concerning than uh, archery, for instance. Uh, yeah, it is across all sports, but for, for the, the ones that are higher risk, the close contact sports, what we also do is nasopharyngeal PCR tests on, the, on both teams after the event, as well as the tests that are done before. Um, but the reality there is, you know, if you look at the evidence, there is very little evidence in the literature of any transmission of COVID on the field of play. You know, and there's been a few good studies now, particularly there's been studies from Qatar who've been looking at the, the, the football games in preparation for the World Cup. They've done a lot of studies with testing before and after the event. Uh, a good documented, good solid database, and they find no evidence of transmission. What tends to happen where there's transmission, it's in the socialising around the event, not on the field of play. And of course, they're not allowed to socialise, and uh, I should imagine at all. No, and at the moment, you know, the athletes are only allowed to come into the village five days before they start competition, and they have to leave within forty-eight hours of finishing. You know, so the traditional, if you like, um, socialising in a happy way usually tends to come with athletes who finish their competitions, who stay in the village. That won't happen this year, you know, which, which is a pity in a sense. A lot of things about these games will be less comfortable and less exciting than previous games, but that's the price we have to pay for, for doing it in a pandemic. Yeah, and that, that brings me to, to another thought I've had about extrinsic pressures. Um, what do you do when you start... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking one of the great basketballers or something, and he might have arrived PCR positive, but they're trying to get him cleared for the for the final, which is at the end of the Olympic Games. Uh, the, are you feeling any extrinsic pressures, or is everyone just saying Brian is is the boss? No, I don't think they're saying Brian is the boss, but they are taking it seriously <laughs> in a sense. I mean, yeah. Like everything else, like all the decisions we've been making through this pandemic, there's a balance between, you know, what is the good public health thing to do versus all the other competing priorities, you know, whether that's economic pressure, whatever. I would say that in the year I've been chairing the expert group that I have here for this, when we've been looking through what are the right countermeasures, I have never been asked by the IOC to think about money. I've been asked to tell them what we think, <clears throat> what we think is the best thing to do. Now, it would be naive to think there aren't people worrying about the money but they haven't put any pressure on me to say, can we do this in a more cheap way or anything else? They've said, tell us what we need to do and we'll find a way of doing it. Now, when the game start and we start seeing the very high profile athletes, uh, then I'm sure there will be pressure to say, can we make an exception? But so far they've been pretty good about saying, no, we don't do exceptions. You know, we have to do, we've got a protocol. We spend a long time working out to ensure it's the right one, the safe one. Let's not start bending the rules at this stage. So, so tell me, Brian, what uh, keeps you awake at night? What's, uh, what's the worst thing that can happen here in the next two weeks? Um, it's a good question, and it, probably, it might even not be COVID, because you know, we always sat down for a lot in 2012 thinking, what could go wrong? Um, and you know, the two things that were the top of our you know, keep you awake list, one was a SARS coronavirus type outbreak happening during the world during the game. It didn't happen to us, but now we're doing it. Uh, and the other is a potential terrorist incident and things. You know, but really, 
what's what keeps away here probably is losing control of the process at the moment you know we are in a good public health position because we've got a very solid track and trace system in place we know that every case is being identified we know every contact's been identified and we know we're dealing with those and as long as that holds up then i'm comfortable that we won't have any big super spreading events if that system breaks down then i start to lose sleep more what's your team look like brian you must have uh thousands of uh, contact tracers and epidemiologists and data managers and, and probably some other great minds beside you to, to bounce ideas off? Well, I, I'm lucky in the sense that I'm, I'm only here as an advisor. I don't actually do anything. <laughs> I just give advice. <laughs> no, but there is, uniquely for this Games, within the main operating centre, which is you know, the big up centre that runs the Games completely, for this Games is set up an infectious disease control centre as well which is jointly staffed by the organising committee uh, and the public health team from the metropolitan government. And that's about 50 people at the moment. And they're the ones who are keeping track of the test results and, and who needs contact tracing. We've brought in a thing for this game called COVID liaison officers, which are people based in every team. And they're responsible for being the liaison between the disease control team and the athletes and the teams. And they've been trained, if you like, to do all the administration and in part do the contact tracing and stuff. And we've got 3,000 of those uh, across the village in total. So we have a big workforce in that sense. And then with the IOC, we have a set of people who are dedicated to managing, if you like, the information flow around that. And I think spectators are banned altogether now. Is that the situation? Yeah, pretty much. In theory, for events that happen outside Tokyo, because Tokyo is in a state of emergency, uh, other prefectures in Japan are not. And if they're not, they could have spectators. But at the moment, they're sitting to a consistent policy of no spectators. Now, the, the case numbers have actually gone down in the last day or so in Tokyo. So whether they review that or not is up to the Japanese government. You know, they, they have run, you know, football and baseball throughout the pandemic here in Japan without any problems. But the, but the Olympics are seen, are seen as being a slightly in a slightly different category because of the international, international context. And just a final question. I, d I don't think it's too late. Um, do, would, would you like some help over there? I think I can uh, free up some time at this end. Absolutely. But there are some restrictions when you come here in terms of what you can and can't do, one of which being there's no alcohol. Yeah, that could be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, Brian, um, great, great talking to you. It's, uh, it's an exciting uh, moment we'll all be be watching and and thinking of thinking about you and uh and hopefully thinking that you've got a smile on your face rather than uh, your head in your hands well i hope it stays that way anyway i'll try and make sure it keeps it keeps like that <laughs> okay thanks a lot for coming on brian okay good to see you dale cheers okay, bye. bye all right thank you very much dale that was uh, entertaining and i i, I considering how much money is involved uh, in various aspects of the olympics i seriously doubt money is uh, is a primary concern for them so uh, but thank you for that uh, that uh, introducing us to him uh and time is short louisa over to you oh dear time is short i do have a bit of a longer take segment your today time but... take your time we want to hear we want to learn so we will go through um, a summary of treatments uh, on COVID. Somehow it's never really managed to catch the spotlight so far. But uh, with the surge um, locally currently, I thought it would be a good time to bring up uh, because a proportion of these cases are unvaccinated. So starting from the beginning, um, memories came back for when in the earliest days, many physicians and including myself considered treating patients with hydroxychloroquine and Kaletra based on initial in vivo in vitro uh, viral studies and small clinical studies showing um, that it reduces viral shedding. And subsequently, we've of course found out through more robust clinical trials that neither of these two work. So I still bring this up uh, though, because it really belongs to a bigger issue uh, that we face um, still today. And um, there was and continues to be two main debates around uh, repurposing drugs for COVID-19 treatment. So first, is it whether it's acceptable, acceptable to use repurposed drugs based on preclinical or laboratory science data uh, of drug properties, plus minus maybe having some anecdotal reports or expert opinion, but without having clear evidence from actual clinical trials. So on one hand, it seems to be a compelling stand to take as a doctor facing a pandemic, um, watching a pandemic unfold and looking for any promising treatments for our patients. And it's very difficult to just stand by and not do anything at all. 
However, on the flip side of this, there's also a good reason why generally well-designed clinical trials are still the gold standard of um, evidence-based medicine. And even though randomized controlled trials themselves can have their issues, but when conducted well, they are able to generate the most robust data. So therefore, if we are truly abiding by the do no harm principle, we may not want to jump the gun and start repurposing drugs too prematurely that have not been run through more rigorous trial standards. And to me, both sides of the argument are actually valid. Um, and as with most ethical dilemmas, you're not really choosing between a right and a wrong. You're choosing between a right and a maybe more right, depending on which angle you're looking at. So it's really not black and white, and that's something we'll continue to struggle with. And the other point of contention is about how, uh, whether we allow studies and trials uh, to be made available to read as preprints without going through the more um, rigorous process or, and slower process though of peer review. So one argument for the benefit of this, of course, is especially during a pandemic, we need rapid dissemination of information across a wide network. So that's very reasonable. However, I think that a very important caveat is that the reader then must be equipped with very good skills on interpreting research results and know to exercise much heightened caution on the quality of the studies and data that's being presented. So this will help to filter at least the studies that have not gone through the peer review process. And we'll see an example of this later. So now going through the treatments that we're using for COVID-19 now, this graphic may be familiar to some of you and it's commonly used and it nicely represents um, the different clinical phases and illness severity of COVID-19. And most importantly, what actually drives the pathophysiology behind the severity in each phase. So this helps us in a nutshell to understand why certain treatments work and when they can be given. So next up we have, oh, so sorry, the first drug we have here is actually uh, remdesivir. So it's an antiviral. And the thing about remdesivir is that there are actually two sets of seemingly conflicting information on its benefit. Now, the US NIAID ran a randomized control trial, which kickstarted their ACTT trial series. And the results were suggestive of benefit of remdesivir, although it did not um, eventually meet the power to prove it, as the trial was stopped early, in order to also offer patients who were on the uh, who were in the placebo arm remdesivir. So to the study team, their explanation um, at the time was that the primary outcome was actually looking at recovery rate, and this was already met through the trial when they decided to stop it early, and it was proven positive. Hence, they did not feel that it was actually ethical to withhold the drug from other patients who were on placebo in the trial. And since the mortality data was also in favor of remdesivir, even though it was not statistically significant, they decided that this was good enough at the time. And furthermore, there was an external independent data and safety monitoring panel um, that also looked at the study data at the time it ended and uh, made a recommendation that the next step uh, was of the trial should be to test it against another drug agent. So this seemed to indirectly support the opinion that remdesivir did in indeed in uh, show enough benefit from the ACTT1 trial. Hence, the FDA at the time issued an emergency use authorization for remdesivir. However, shortly after this, uh, the WHO Solidarity Trial Consortium released a preprint, which is now published in the NEJM, showing that remdesivir, also along with interferon, hydroxychloroquine, and Kaletra, um, all had little or no effect on hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in terms of overall mortality, initiation of ventilation, and a duration of hospital stay. So this caused quite a bit of confusion for everyone to decide whether they should really continue using remdesivir um, if it was available to them. So what I will just point out is that these two trials were actually very different. The NIAID's trials were actually looking specifically at remdesivir alone comparing to placebo through a standard randomized control trial, and they had a specific clinical question to answer. But the Sol Solidarity trial series had a very different purpose. It was an open label randomized trial, and it was designed to be able to involve hundreds of hospitals uh, across dozens of countries to allow collection of a larger amount of information information from diverse settings. So the trial protocols had to be quite simple and therefore um, it had no placebo arms. It allowed recruitment of patients of different disease severity and phases, and they may not have had confirmed laboratory diagnosis of COVID-19. So this trial design allowed different hospitals to give one of the four drugs that were tested against patients who were receiving, who were receiving the local standard of care, which could also vary 
hugely. So as it was uh, an adaptive trial as well, it additionally meant that um, unpromising drugs could be dropped and others added it at any time. So you can see that comparing these two trials are like comparing apples and oranges. And um, for a setting like Singapore though, where we can mimic the NIAID trial settings in our standard care of patients, our local guidelines can therefore give clear recommendations on when remdesivir can be considered. And decisions are still made according to a patient's overall disease progression and clinical status, as well as other ongoing treatments and monitoring that's available. But remdesivir doesn't have too many contraindications to its use, and so far in Singapore's experience, it's overall quite safe. Okay, so next up are the drugs that are actually used um, to uh, that work for the inflammatory phase of COVID-19. And of course, dexamethasone is really the star here. It's probably one of the least controversial COVID-19 treatments available so far. And in a nutshell, it has proven mortality benefit benefit for patients who are on oxygen therapy or require mechanical ventilation. So it's considered pretty much a standard of care. Um, another drugs, um, another few drugs in the anti-inflammatory, um, sorry, in the anti-inflammatory category, which are used to treat that hyperinflammation in severe or critical COVID, are two classes of uh, drugs. One is interleukin six, and one is a JAK inhibitor. So for interleukin six, um, there are tocilizumab and cerilumab that have been studied widely, and we use tocilizumab in Singapore, and um, they are IL six inhibitors, and IL six is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So these are usually typically are uh, used as agents to treat rheumatological and autoimmune conditions, and similarly as our JAK um, inhibitors. So for JAK inhibitors, we have our baricitinib, as well as our more recently studied tofacitinib. And they suppress cellular JAK signals, which stimulate immune cells to again uh, produce inflammatory proteins. So for tocilizumab, again, there was actually some debate over its true benefits uh, in the beginning. And this is a forest plot that IDSA put together looking at the mortality outcome data from the different prominent um, randomized control trials um, on tocilizumab. So putting to, um, aside the larger issues of study design, types of trials, and whether there was blinding, the key thing to understand behind all these different trials were that they were actually done in different countries at different time points. And there were different population trial, uh, patient populations recruited, and um, there were different standards of uh, background care that were applied. And also, furthermore, there was constantly evolving standards of care at the time of the trials. So clinical understanding of when hyperinflammation begins was also not completely standardized at the time. And the timing, therefore, of the intervention initiation was also different. Um, and there were also other inflammatory drugs, especially steroids, that were given together at the time. So without going into detail of the exact risk of bias, you can see in the table up in the corner that many of the studies actually did have um, carry several or more than one risk of bias. Um, but the WHO just two days ago has also published results um, from a meta-analysis looking at the overall mortality benefit from IL-6 inhibitor treatments, and it showed two important things. One, the benefit of IL-6 inhibition was evident only in uh, patients who are also concurrently receiving corticosteroids. And number two, the decrease in mortality was seen in those patients who are on supplemental oxygen, high flow oxygen or non-invasive uh, ventilation, but not in those who required mechanical ventilation or ECMO at the time of randomization. So therefore, the use of tocilizumab remains conditional for a carefully selected group of patients who are showing signs of hyperinflammation and with increasing oxygen requirements and those who are at risk of mechanical ventilation. And importantly, cortical steroids must remain the standard backbone of treatment for COVID-19 patients who are requiring oxygen supplementation. So next up, we will discuss um, baricitinib. So far, it's not been uh, widely used in Singapore because, again, it has very specific recommendations. Now, the ACTT2 trial um, that showed benefit was when uh, baricitinib was in, given in addition to remdesivir. Patients had a faster recovery time. And this effect was more prominent in the subgroup of patients who required high-flow oxygen on non-invasive ventilation. But when a next step was taken in the ACTT4 trial to add standard dexamethasone, um, dexamethasone 
cortisone therapy in as a comparator. Now, this ACTG4 trial had to be stopped early because there was no evidence that baricitinib plus remdesivir would perform any better than dexamethasone plus remdesivir. So the use of baricitinib, again, should be in combination with remdesivir if it's considered, and therefore is limited to quite a small subset of patients who cannot receive dexamethasone for any reason. And tofacitinib, um, in a recent Brazil study published in NEJM, shows promising data uh, that when compared to placebo, patients uh, receiving tofacitinib had lower risk for respiratory failure or mortality. In the trial, it was given for patients with COVID-19 pneumonia within 72 hours of admission and who were on oxygen uh, supplementation but did not, re again, require mechanical ventilation. So it's readily available as a rheumatological drug in Singapore as well, but I'm not sure whether it's been locally used yet, but because it's not um, been approved for COVID-19 use anywhere yet. But also like baricitinib, it has a, a very small subset of patients for which it's suitable for probably within a certain therapeutic window. Uh, these patients probably are pro rapidly progressing towards needing high flow oxygen therapy or mechanical ventilation. Uh, and that's when I may consider adding tofacitinib to, again, the standard dexamethasone and remdesivir therapy. So now the big question um, that this raises now is whether there will be any advantage for IL-6 inhibitors or JET inhibitors over each other in combination with dexamethasone, as there are no trials comparing this head-to-head um, -head as of now. And so the considerations for use can be very similar, so this would be an area to watch. So just to note, though, that while we have um, good, these are good options for the treatment of severe and critical COVID-19, we also need to be very aware that these drugs are all essentially immune suppressors or modifiers. And so we need to be very, very vigilant about also the increased risk of infections when we are giving these drugs. So now, and just a very quick run through on monoclonal antibodies, uh, which are essentially antibodies that have been harvested and cloned. They have a singular activity against a predetermined target, which in the case of SARS-CoV-2 will be the spike protein in most cases. Um, but this is not to be confused with convalescent plasma, which consists of polyclonal antibodies. And I'm not including convalescent plasma in this talk because there's no good evidence that it works so far. So Singapore has got an intermittent authorization for a monoclonal antibody called Sotro map and our treatment guidelines are currently being updated. But generally, monoclonal antibodies are recommended for use uh, for in patients with who are less sick with mild to moderate disease, but also who have specific risk factors for disease progression, as you can see here. Okay, so now um, you're getting to a bit of a fun part. Um, and as a prelude, I'm just going to say that eventually everyone is entitled to their own opinion, and I'm just here to share mine to contribute to the discussion on these following treatments. So now vitamin D is actually a really popular topic of discussion, not only for COVID-19, but historically it has already been actually widely studied for its potential effects to reduce the risk of infection and specifically against acute respiratory infections. So um, I wanted to address this commentary in particular for a uh, vitamin study in COVID-19 uh, because there's a lot to pick apart for the data that it shows. And this thought process can actually be extrapolated, I think, and applied to many other studies, whether on vitamin D or not. So uh, what you see here is an observational study um, that was conducted in uh, 20 European countries. And um, you can see how vitamin D levels correlate both with the prevalence uh, of COVID-19, sorry, incidence of COVID-19, and also the risk of death from COVID-19. So at first um, glance, you can actually see a clear negative association here, which is a good thing. The higher the rate of vitamin D levels, um, the lower the case numbers, and also the lower the risk of mortality. Now, the authors did claim, though, that this is only a potentially accrued association, and I fully agree that it cannot really be more than that. So firstly, we can think of a clear confounder in this, is that the elderly population are more likely to have lower vitamin D levels, but the elderly population are also more likely to have higher mortality from COVID-19. So putting one and one together here, you still only somehow have one, so that doesn't really say much. And next, 
if you actually look at the vitamin D levels that they studied, there is actually no universal uh, consensus on the standard sufficient or optimal levels of vitamin D from country to country, medical society to medical society and population to population. But for the purposes of illustration, I'll take a commonly agreed upon 50 nanomoles per liter um, as sufficient and allow a higher uh, level of 70 nanomoles per liter as optimal. And um, generally a vitamin D level of less than 30 nanomoles per liter is considered severe deficiency. So then you can see that actually most of the cases here are clustered around already sufficient vitamin D levels. And one country with a mortality of over 50 per 1 million population even has optimal vitamin D levels. So and in fact, none of these countries uh, means actually meet the criteria for severe vitamin D sufficiency. So even if there was a crude association between vitamin D and COVID-19 incidence or mortality, it's very different from actually saying that vitamin D actually offers protection against COVID-19. So in fact, this tells me that probably we need to start looking for um, a very hard to achieve supra optimal uh, high vitamin D serum level before we can even start to study um, its protective effects. So now let's let look at uh, let's look at uh, the mortality rates more closely here, and which I've uh, just arbitrarily divided into three brackets and excluded some of the outliers. So in this bottom yellow box, you can see that it already captures more than half of the dots on the plot, and that represents the lower bracket uh, of mortality rates between zero to fifty per million population, and in fact half of these dots are even below uh, twenty-five. So and if we look at the next bracket. Uh, of between uh, 50 to 100 mortality per pop million population, there's only three dots here. So that can't really tell us much. And then looking at the even higher mortality rates of 100 to 150 per million population, there's basically just one vitamin D level represented here. So now going to the numbers on the actual table, it confirms what we saw on the previous slide. So most of these countries here actually already have a vit mean vitamin D level, level that is considered sufficient. And just to widen the mortality uh, rates uh, brackets further for comparison, uh, we can see that for for the mortality rates of uh, below 20, which is the yellow boxes, and for the mortality rates of higher between 100 to 200 per million population, the vitamin D levels are only slightly higher on average in the low, lower mortality rate bracket. So the difference is really not that obvious either. So when we are trying to decipher um, any data, we should just be careful to examine for ourselves what the content really shows. And therefore, my takeaways for vitamin D is that if you require vitamin D supplementation to reduce fracture risk or for any other medical reason, please do continue it as per your doctor's advice. But for the rest of us, vitamin D supplementation actually can't be easily standardized um, and it doesn't replace your healthy lifestyle and dietary choices. Um, go out and walk to your vaccination center and get your dose of vitamin D along the way. So, okay, now, if you're still following, this is where you might, some of you might get a sparkle in your eye because we are finally addressing ivermectin. We've always received um, many questions on ivermectin because, because indeed the data can be quite confusing. Um, but hopefully I can pick it apart a little bit for you today. So where this all started was that um, there seems to be quite strong laboratory or in vitro data that ivermectin can effectively inhibit viral replication. But then if we look at the serum levels uh, that would be required for in vivo effectiveness, those translate to drug doses that are about 100 times of the dosing regimens that are typically used for, um, to treat anything in human treatment. And so therefore, it's impossible to achieve these super high um, serum levels. But over the course of the pandemic, we've also gotten a very uh, constant slow stream of studies reporting positive results for ivermectin in treating co uh, COVID-19 in clinical trials. And a very recent meta-analysis of 24 of these clinical trials seem to have looked at all of these and supported a conclusion of overall benefit. But let's take a closer look at this. So specifically, um, these are the studies um, in the meta-analysis looking at mortality outcomes. So if we're only crude, crudely, again, looking at the forest plot, we would think that ivermectin really does have a mortality benefit here. But without going into too much detail um, on in each individual study here, I'll just bring your attention to what type of studies they were. Out of these, only three were actually peer-reviewed studies and about half were actually preprints to date without peer review.
But alarmingly, three of these studies were actually are actually currently unpublished still, meaning there is actually no way to even verify or easily look at the data they present. So if you're interested and uh, want to look at this paper yourself, just keep this in mind as you read the conclusions that are presented. And as I mentioned, uh, preprints at the beginning of the talk. Now, I'm not in any way saying that they should not be made available, but again, we need to have a very clear idea that the quality can really vary quite greatly, and we need to be very discerning when we're looking for information here. And this in particular was one of the two main studies that seemed to drive the overall positive mortality benefit from using ivermectin. So it's been to date widely cited even by papers published in high impact factor journals, but it was actually still always a preprint uh, when it was cited and it was never accepted for publication. And then just a few days ago, it's been retracted after its integrity has been severely called into question. It was exposed by a London-based medical student who discovered several critical problems about the paper after reading it and including large amounts um, of plagiarized uh, writing for one. And there were also many suspicious points about the data and mainly uh, checked by a data analysis eventually found that at least 79% of the records in the study were actually duplicates from other data sets. So for the rest of the studies on ivermectin, there are overall several issues uh, with their small sample sizes, um, wide heterogeneity in the design, as well as methodological in, uh, limitations, which all severely affect their quality. So therefore, the takeaway for me for ivermectin is that there is insufficient data at present to suggest a benefit for using ivermectin as a treatment for COVID-19. And lastly, this is my final slide. It's just to be aware that some of these proposed treatments actually can have harmful effects for certain patients. So I guess the consistent and overall take home message again for today is to just be very cautious about what you're reading, look for reliable sources and don't fall prey to the infodemic. Thanks, Louisa. I will call you when, okay. <laughs> when I have a question. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to just leap right in. This is just something to start you off. I came across uh, this article, I'm sure as many of you did, uh, and found it uh, mildly entertaining uh, and uh, concerned that uh, people would go too far with this. But we found uh, reason that fecal uh, microbiota transplantation would be useful for a lot of things. Uh, I will tell you, reviewing these uh, two cases that uh, were discussed, uh, they're pretty anecdotal. Uh, but it is an interesting observation. Here we go. Uh, the vaccines currently used uh, in use that have been uh, uh, authorized or in limited use uh, are those mentioned. I have screened out some, which I'll, I'll show you on the, on the next slide, or this, fo uh, this slide following that. You'll see in, uh, in uh, ASEAN, we have increasing uh, numbers of, uh, let's see if I can get my, laser pointer going. Uh, we have increasing uh, uh, numbers of uh, countries using uh, the Sputnik V and, and Moderna uh, more recently. Uh, and we're going to speak, uh, the arrows there, because we're going to speak in a little more detail about that. I think one of the more concerning things is COVAX was been, meant to be a uh, facility where we could distribute a vaccine to those countries who otherwise couldn't access it, either because they didn't get in purchase orders or they don't have the resources to do so. And remember, there's 7.6 billion people on Earth. They've, they've been able to distribute 136 million doses so far. So this has been a little concerning, and I'll speak to this in just a moment. So uh, hope in the future lies with new vaccines, one of which uh, has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, this is Novavax, or uh, you can see its uh, uh, name there at the top uh, left. It's a protein subunit vaccine. Um, we don't have a lot of those yet. Uh, I'll show you some that are in the works in just a moment um, or, or available. It uses a very strong adjuvant. It's relatively effective in preventing a, a symptomatic disease uh, and quite effective in preventing severe disease. And it works well in the elderly. And you can give it with influenza vaccine. So it has a lot going for it. It has one uh, Achilles heel, and that's uh, in the beta variant where uh, it, its activity was relatively low. Really don't have much data on gamma or delta yet. Uh, it's, it's been safe, and there are a variety of ongoing trials. 
uh, whether it's in young people or potentially using it as a booster for the existing vaccines, which it might it looks like it might be quite uh, uh, encouraging. And it hadn't been approved yet in any country. Uh, there's phase three data underway and will be presented quite shortly. And there's a lot of enthusiasm because 300 million doses have been ordered. Uh, so the potential role for these uh, protein subunit vaccines, and you can see some of them which have already been uh, had emergency use authorization in some countries, um, uh, is for either primary series for someone who can't or doesn't want to receive an mRNA vaccine, uh, who wants an alternative, or a second dose for those with anaphylaxis of the first dose of mRNA vaccine, or as a booster uh, down the road. So there, there's going to be a role for these uh, uh, vaccines, but there's quite a few. Uh, again, there's several that have been uh, one country approved, and on phase three, there's eight of them right now. These are some other vaccines, again, that have emergency use, uh, use authorization, uh, but are available just in the country where they were developed. This is an mRNA vaccine like Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, um, but it's only available in Japan at this time. But you can see Iran, China, Russia, Kazakhstan, they and Cuba have come up with their own vaccines to, to help with the uh, access issues. Well, so far, as of today, 3.71 billion doses. It's quite encouraging because it's a billion doses since our last webinar uh, about 28 days ago. So that's uh, pretty darn impressive. Uh, you can Singapore, as I mentioned earlier, uh, has pretty good penetration there with a little over 70% uh, have received at least one dose of which uh, almost a half have received uh, uh, two doses. Um, sadly, our, our brothers and sisters in the region, uh, we're, we're still below 30%. And and in Africa, which is a giant concern, um, yeah, it, it's less than 5%. Uh, as far as other uh, countries, or comparable countries, Chile is uh, quite high penetration, almost uh, uh, the same as Singapore. Um, Israel, and I'll show you a, a kinetics graph to see that they're slowing down. Um, Malaysia is uh, right at around 32%, and uh, Indonesia, where we really need vaccine, is uh, less than 15%. Um, progress has been made, but more needs to be made. As far as in Singapore, the efforts to increase the, the percentage of folks vaccinated in prior, prior months, I've discussed some of those issues. Uh, this last month, uh, we've uh, been able to increase the capacity for vaccination, uh, getting our foreign domestic workers uh, our, uh, that, that didn't have uh, infection earlier, uh, uh, PR and long-term pass holders that are younger, uh, those who've had anaphylaxis, the first dose, getting Coronavac and mobile vaccination stations. Also supporting efforts uh, for international seafarers, although we're not using our own stockpile to do that. Again, these are the vaccines available through the pandemic uh, uh, access. Uh, these are the special access route that are not uh, uh, approved by HSA, uh, but uh, WHO has provided emergency use authorization for them. Uh, you can see that the pace is slowing. I mentioned about vaccination stagnation uh, last month, but I just wanted to show you Singapore has been managed to uh, has managed to push through that ceiling that other countries seem to be running up against. Uh, United Kingdom and Israel, um, as well as the United States, you see it's flattening off, and Africa is really not taken off yet. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this. We spoke about vaccine hesitancy and complacency and eligibility, et cetera. That seems to be melting away as we increase the age groups and the people who are, are able to get it. The problem is getting access. Uh, countries that haven't uh, bought it in advance, COVAX has not been able to get the donations that were promised to them. This is a bit of an issue. And all, obviously a concern is misinformation. Um, there's been discussion of what role social media may play in this. They may, this may be diverting from other issues, but that's certainly a, a, a potential platform for people to uh, transmit information that might be uh, uh, not, not, might not be accurate. Um, Let's see if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, and, and again, as far as access to vaccine and distribution of vaccine, this is a big problem. Two thirds of the shots promised bilaterally have arrived, but this is through bilateral agreements. This is not through COVAX. And when countries use bilateral agreements, it, it, it's all, it can be altruism, but it can also be a geopolitical manipulation, uh, et cetera. They're trying to get someone to do something for them. Uh, China has produced uh, nearly half of all the global uh, doses given. Uh, and uh, as you would expect, for any country, domestic use is the dominant, but they've also distributed uh, EU, uh, US, even less percentage, uh, and, and so forth. These are in billions at the bottom, not 500,000, but 500 million doses. Um, 
and the promised uh, donations, uh, have, but uh, unfortunately in these, inter uh, these uh, bilateral uh, deals, this is not COVEX, uh, haven't, haven't arrived. So China has primarily delivered what they promised. U.S. has not. Uh, India has, even though they needed vaccine. Japan has not, et cetera. So vaccine diplomacy, uh, is, as far as using the vaccine and bilateral arrangements, has taken a priority over COVAX, unfortunately. COVAX is designed to find where the need is and get the vaccine there. Uh, vaccine diplomacy may have other motives, such as Israel uh, rewarding the Czech Republic and Guatemala, Honduras, and Hungary for supporting uh, Jerusalem as its capital, UK using it as part of trade negotiations with Australia. China is said to, and this is putative, has said to have asked Honduras to end its recognition of Taiwan, et cetera. India uh, tried to counter uh, regional uh, influence from China, and the U.S. is responding to Russia's donation by giving to Mexico and Afghanistan and others. So 76% of all vaccine doses have administered in just 10 countries. That's an, a, a sobering uh, statistic. Uh, now, that this data is a little bit old. It's a couple of weeks old, but it's still, there's a huge disparity. And despite having uh, almost half the world's population, they've only received about 16, 20% uh, of the vaccine. So let's review what we review. I've, I've slimmed down this, uh, the chart. And again, I remind everybody, this data is not directly comparable. Uh, and, and these are a compilation of a variety of uh, uh, sources. But the new information is in red. Um, and I just want to show you about Pfizer BioNTech uh, as far as the Delta variant. Uh, there's been a number of studies showing how effective it is in preventing symptomatic uh, infection. In Singapore, we've had about 80 to 90 percent. Canada, 87. UK, 88. Israel found 64 percent, interestingly. Um, Israel did find 93 percent in preventing serious infection, as did we, and 96 percent uh, prevented uh, uh, hospitalization in UK. So overall, pretty darn reasonable. Sinovac, uh, there's a study uh, down here, effectiveness of inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine in Chile is about Sinovac. Uh, also, its name is Coronavac, the company that distributes and manufactures its Sinovac. 15% uh, of their isolates were alpha, 25% of their isolates were gamma. They had no information uh, on delta. Um, and you can see that they had 66% symptomatic uh, prevention as opposed to these numbers here, comparable to Israel's. 88% uh, decrease in hospitalization uh, and uh, death 86%. So not quite the same. Um, the data coming out of Indonesia is uh, less uh, solid at this point to be able to put anything to it. Uh, folks in Thailand have found that uh, neutralizing antibody uh, with Sinovac against a Delta has been uh, relatively poor. Uh, Two doses of vaccine, this was uh, mentioned by Dale uh, in the epidemiology section, is, is quite important. You can see here's an example of uh, Fiji has had one dose, mostly it being AstraZeneca. Mostly they're dealing with Delta, and this is what their mortality is doing. This is what uh, he described. Both their cases are going up and their mortality is skyrocketing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, United Kingdom has 53% have had two doses. Fiji has had only 7.4% of two doses, even though they've got almost 40% of the population, high mortality. Two doses, 50%, very little mortality. It's not really rising. In uh, uh, Malaysia has about 14, 15% two doses. Uh, excuse me, Malaysia is here. It's climbing a bit, not at the pace of Fiji, but it's climbing a bit. So again, indirect evidence that either having alpha, which is the vaccines tend to be more active against, uh, which you can see Serbia uh, has almost no deaths, uh, but having two doses is an important uh, step. So are there vaccine differences? This is a very busy slide. We are not going through it. I'm just showing you to, to say the summation is yes. As far as preventing, uh, as far as transparency and access to data so that we can make independent assessment of these drugs, uh, Pfizer and Moderna have been uh, really uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite transparent. Uh, Takeda, uh, not as much information. But these uh, vaccines have prevented symptomatic infection. They've been very good for the ancestral wild type, very, and good to very good for the variants, preventing serious infection and death. Superb for all the variants. As far as the adenovirus, such as AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, where we have more data, not quite so much for Sputnik. Uh, again, transparency has been good for these two vaccines. It's been very good for the ancestral, okay for variants except beta. Its, uh, its ability to prevent serious illness and death has been superb. Uh, 
But the inactivated vaccines, there's been more challenge, and the WHO has has uh, stated this as so, uh, getting access to information. Um, and Singapore HSA has stated it as so. Um, and the real world experience with these, as far as the variants goes, it's been good to very good for the wild type, but with a real world experience with the variants in all these different countries, Mongolia, Bahrain, uh, Bahrain Chile, Seychelles, et cetera, who had high, relatively high vaccination rates at the time of outbreaks was not so encouraging. We, know, we hear about cases uh, and stories in, of healthcare workers in Indonesia and in Thailand. So these are good for the original strain, less so for the variants. Uh, at least beta and, and gamma. Uh, Singapore uh, Ministry of Health, because of this lack of or this incomplete data and the concerns about it, um, they don't really uh, uh, consider those who've received Sinovac to have been vaccinated when they tabulate uh, the vaccinated. This right upper uh, quadrant, these graphs, I'm not going to bore you with it, I'm say gr uh, blue is what arose from an mRNA vaccine. You can see before the vaccination, uh, after one dose and two doses, this is how much antibody to various ways of measuring antibody. Uh, this is Sinovac, after one dose, still unmeasurable, uh, after two doses, uh, better. Um, and so again, one dose unmeasurable, two dose better, one dose very low, better, et cetera, whereas uh, the other vaccines. So if we look at, at the mRNA vaccines, much higher. So if we look to uh, uh, neutralizing antibody as being one of our correlates of protection, which there's some data to support, at least for some of the variants, uh, then, uh, then Sinovac is not, uh, there is a difference between Sinovac and the mRNA vaccines. So let's talk about some uh, associated, some notable vaccine associated events with the mRNA vaccines. We've had anaphylaxis and myocarditis, which I'll speak to in just a, a bit more in just a moment. And adenovirus, just this is a scorecard to keep track of what's gone on. We've had thrombocytopenia with thrombosis uh, syndrome, and you can see the, the numbers there, and Guillain Barre uh, with J and J. Um, so again, uh, with this information in mind, uh, the data suggests uh, that uh, the, the benefit far, far outweighs the risks of these events occurring uh, uh, for those who uh, uh, are selected to receive it and are eligible. Let's just talk about myocarditis, which has been associated with the mRNA vaccines. This is background myocarditis in children and adults before the the pandemic era. So you can see that it's, it's a disease of young people, young teenagers, um, uh, and, and you can see with age it goes down, and it's mostly a disease of male over female. Um, this is from the uh, uh, Vaccine Adverse Event, uh, event Report uh, uh, surveillance after the mRNA vaccines, and you can see the second dose is in red, the first dose is in blue. Um, it's in people from the age of 16 to, to 40 about, uh, and it's generally males greater than females, uh, and much more so in the 16 to 24 range or so. And this is the data, this is data from the US. Um, this is the day of onset. It's, uh, some of them have been a few days, after, up to four days or so after the first dose, but the vast majority uh, have been after the second dose within the first three to four days. Um, so when you look at uh, populations, if you look at if try to get risk benefit per million cases of uh, second doses of vaccine over 120 days in uh, young women, uh, teenage girls, uh, you'll prevent 8,500 cases, uh, one death and 38 ICU admissions and have eight to 10 myocarditis cases. Um, in uh, males, 12 to 17, you'll prevent 5,700 cases uh, and the associated problems with uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, uh, prevention of long COVID uh, in all likelihood, protection against variants, and uh, prevention of 4% uh, or so of kids who get COVID who have uh, neurologic complications. You've got uh, about 60 myocarditis cases uh, and 71 uh, uh, ICU uh, uh, cases prevented and 215 hospitalizations. Um, Boosters would be needed uh, if a primary vaccine ser series is not achieving its goal, meaning unacceptable post-vaccination morbidity and mortality um, and uh, waning or absent correlates of protection, whatever they are, whatever those correlates turn out to be. Or there's a new variant that is uh, clinically immune-scaping available vaccines. Uh, 
maybe uh, we wouldn't be so troubled if they're causing mild disease, but if they're causing death uh, or not preventing death or um, severe complications, then that would be a concern. So as a consequence, uh, Israel is already recommending a, a booster, an mRNA booster for those who are immunocompromised, immunocompromised hosts, except those with solid tumors getting chemotherapy. UK has been advised to offer booster in September for those uh, meeting those criteria greater than 70 nursing homes immunocompromised hosts are vulnerable. Pfizer says, yes, we can sell more vaccine. Uh, and FDA and CDC says, uh, not so fast. There's no real signal yet. The good news is there's some data with the mRNA vaccines that uh, germinal center B cells and long-lived bone marrow plasma cells, which are markers of, uh, uh, of long-lasting immunity are present. There's also some data looking at neutralizing antibody eight months out in, in Italy, where some of the early uh, surges were that showed that they have uh, sustained a fairly acceptable level of uh, antibody. So how do we predict success? What are the correlates of protection? Well, we focused on neutralizing antibody. That's what all the charts I've showed you. That's what everybody refers to. That's what uh, Pfizer is looking at to see that they may need a booster. But the reality is, is that may not be so. Uh, this is an article that suggested it, that they could uh, determine a correlate of protection based on neutralizing antibody or anti-spike protein antibody um, out of Oxford, but this was against alpha uh, and wild type strain. Uh, but it doesn't really, the antibodies don't really tell the whole story. Uh, infections have occurred in those who've had antibodies and patients without measurable uh, neutralizing antibodies have recovered. So T cells play a role in checking infection progression. There's no question. So what's the relative importance of antibodies versus T cell function? Well, it's likely a function of viral load, what, what you were exposed to, your existing uh, antibodies from either vaccination or infection, and not just to uh, receptor binding domain. Um, the specific variant you got exposed, the existing T cell recognizing common coronavirus epitopes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's gonna be tricky to come up with one single correlate of protection. This is my last slide. This is just to, uh, a shout out to my brothers and sisters in the trenches. Uh, these are healthcare workers in Italy that were uh, infected with COVID. Uh, and, and many of them mildly, but some of them died then. This was before the vaccine uh, or vaccines. Uh, and, and we don't know what percentage of these people ended up with long-term cognitive or other somatic symptoms associated, uh, 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 clinical symptoms associated with long COVID. Um, so it's interesting, at least in this, the, in this Lombardy region of Italy, rheumatologists had the highest risk of, uh, uh, of acquiring uh, COVID. Uh, internal medicine next, and palliative care, then ED, et cetera. ID physicians were not far behind. I think ID physicians were, uh, uh, so here we are, right here. We're still above uh, of the mean. Um, and uh, our brothers and sisters in plastic surgery managed to avoid it. So um, uh, it wasn't... Uh, Dominantly physicians, these were healthcare assistants, uh, and and pay respects to and and, and all uh, warm regards for our colleagues who are in the front lines, the healthcare assistants and nurses, and then physicians were middle of the road, and then medical students a little lower down, and then laboratory personnel and radiographers were lowest. So the risk factors were uh, working on the COVID wards, which would make sense. Uh, being in the emergency department where you didn't anticipate someone might have COVID early in their pandemic uh, in Lombardy uh, and in their palliative care unit. I'm not exactly sure why that was a risk factor uh, and they couldn't explain it either. Uh, if you had prolonged contact, which makes sense. And if you weren't familiar with PPE, which may explain some of our, our colleagues' uh, risk. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for your attention and ask you, Dale, um, tell us about your video. Well done, David. Well done, Louisa. I'm reminded yet again that this is the, the place you come once a month to catch up with everything. Um, but before people go, I want to introduce you to a guy called Rishi Budrani. He's one of Singapore's great comedians. Um, we knew there was, uh, yeah, uh, and also keep a lookout for him, actually, his shows and his Facebook page. I caught up with a few of his videos on, on YouTube. Uh, anyway, we know there was some confusion over how transmission was happening in the KTV cluster. So we actually contacted him and asked if he could yeah, explain this to us in simple terms. So I think it's a video that's uh, well worth watching for a couple of minutes. Our epidemiological investigations have identified that most of the cases in this cluster have visited multiple KTV 
uh, clubs and outlets, multiple visits to several KTV outlets on the same day, or multiple days. I'd just like to add to what our Director of Medical Services has said. Uh, there was an article in the uh, Straits Times discussing the uh, butterfly effect and how it has contributed to the current cluster we have here. I'd just like to address that analogy a little bit. In the industry, the uh, social hostesses are sometimes referred to as butterflies because uh, they will visit uh, multiple different rooms within the, the lounge and uh, service different patrons in different rooms. For the purposes of illustration, we will refer to the patrons as uh, flowers. Let's call the room that they are in the flower bed uh, and that would make the KTV lounge a uh, garden. So essentially what happens is that the butterflies will uh, go to one of the flower beds and uh, visit uh, some of the flowers there and then the uh, butterfly will proceed to move to different flower beds uh, where the cross-pollination might occur and that's where we run the risk of uh, the spread that we are seeing. Now the problem becomes more complicated because some of these butterflies don't limit themselves to one garden. Uh, some of these butterflies will uh, visit multiple different gardens uh, either within the same night or over a period of a few days. The flowers are no less and sometimes they will visit multiple different gardens, uh, thus again contributing to uh, the exponential spread. What you can say is that the butterflies, the flowers and the gardeners, they have all come together to royally screw up our entire ecosystem and that is very disappointing. Um, moving forward, uh, a lot of these butterflies are going to be sent back to their cocoons. As for the gardeners, uh, a lot of them will have their gardening licenses revoked. Uh, some of them might have to move into greenhouses to survive. As for the flowers, I understand there's a fear of being exposed. I understand you are afraid that uh, your partners may chop off your stem or rip out your fruits if uh, they find out that you've been to these gardens. But uh, for the greater good of the entire ecosystem, please come forward and get tested. Uh, Yi Kang, anything to add? Very nice, Dale. Um, uh, you edited that, so those who want to see the uncut version might want to go to the uh, go to YouTube, right? I think Kenneth's in the house as well. So uh, well done for having a sense of humor, <laughs> Kenneth. <laughs> All right, uh, leaves me to thank Brian McCloskey, Louise and Dale for taking the time from their busy schedules to be with us this evening. Uh, next month's episode will be on the 26th at the usual time. Please join us then. Uh, don't forget to submit your ideas for topics to be covered uh, and, con uh, and for us to consider. You can put that in the chat box that'll be uh, open here for about 10 minutes at the end of the episode. We appreciate your feedback. Our pandemic song of the month is from the True Colors Festival in uh, this year in 2021. The song is uh, You Gotta Be. Uh, please note Singaporean uh, musician Daniel Bathan, also known as uh, Will Smith, is amongst the talented artists displaying their virtuosity in this uh, short clip. Uh, until, the, uh, until next month, stay safe, wear your mask, uh, wash your hands, socially distance, and get vaccinated, and encourage uh, everyone you know to get vaccinated. Thank you for watching, enjoy, and good night. You gotta be. Wiser